Hey, I'm Joe Connolly, and together we are going to meet the co-founder of a company that I've read about for years, and you may have too, and I've always thought, what an interesting, great business <laughs> idea. This is Dan Nuxall, co-founder of Rooftop Films. You know the company that goes around and shows films in the summertime on rooftops in New York? Well, they do a lot other than that as well. Um, but how, Dan, did this business get started? Sure. So when we first started out, uh, we didn't even really have in mind that we were going to become a business. So um, I'd gone to uh, college. I grew up in New York City. I'd gone to college with uh, this guy, Mark Elijah Rosenberg. Um, we'd gone to Vassar together, and we both moved back down to the city right after college. And, um, you know, like a lot of other people coming out of school, we didn't necessarily know what we were, wanted to do with our lives, but we knew we wanted to be involved in the arts. And we were doing, dabbling in a bunch of different things, in film and music and um, various other things. Uh, but um, Mark really wanted to put together a film screening in New York City. But, of course, you know, uh, we had absolutely no money whatsoever. He wanted to show some new films, short films, um, that might not otherwise be able to reach an audience in New York City. We didn't have the money to rent a movie theater, but we did have access to uh, Mark's rooftop. So he actually put the very first screening on his own. Um, he was living in a small apartment uh, in, on East 14th Street um, in the East Village. Uh, this would have been 1997. Um, and uh, so he just went up there, uh, borrowed a sound system from his brother who was in a punk rock band, um, borrowed a 16 millimeter projector from a friend, uh, hung a sheet on the wall on the huh. roof, invited a bunch of people up, and a couple of hundred people came through that night, showed a bunch of different short films. People brought their own films through, played them all on 16 millimeter back then. Um, and that was the very first screening. And it wasn't done for money, it was really just done to share. Um, you know, art that we thought was really interesting um, with an audience. That's how rooftop films started by some guys showing a film on a sheet on the roof of their building. That's exactly right. Yeah. So. And now today, what? Multiple cities, multiple employees. Mm -hmm. what, what's it now? Yeah. So now we, uh, you know, we do a lot of different things in the independent film um, world and the film exhibition world. But uh, the thing that we're best known for is the Rooftop Film Summer Series. Um, the Summer Series is basically a summer-long outdoor film festival. It's out. It's actually the biggest outdoor exhibition series of new independent films in the entire country. So uh, we do outdoor tour screenings all throughout the city in all five boroughs, um, usually on rooftops, sometimes in other scenic locations like on the beach or other places along the water and in parks. But um, we do 45 of those events at least every summer, as well as uh, more than 100 other events that we help to put together for other organizations. Uh, they screen all around the city, and uh, we have uh, in the summer we have dozens of employees who are working for us seasonally, and we have over 40,000 people every summer who come out to outdoor screenings that we either produce or co-produce, uh, and it's uh, become something much bigger than what we ever dreamed it might. Who is your customer? The people coming to the film? The sponsor? Tell us the business model here. Yeah, so we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, and early on, you know, we weren't entirely sure if we were going to incorporate as a for-profit or a not-for-profit organization. Um, but it meant a lot to us to um, try to remove as much as possible the profit motive from what we were doing. We believed in the artwork that we were showing. And we also wanted to leave open a space for us to do screenings that might not be profitable, um, hopefully wouldn't be money losing, but would, you know, would be at least, you know, sustainable, but we wanted to remove the profit motive from some of the events that we we're doing. Now, there's some events that we do that are, um, you know, sponsor-supported. Um, there are other events that we do that where the majority of the income might be coming from ticket buyers. Usually, it's a combination of the two. So, we have a bunch of different corporate sponsors. So, Sundance TV is our presenting sponsor. They present all of our events during the summer. Um, we work with, this year, Kettle One and Corona. They support our events and our after parties. That's a big part of our income. We also do uh, some work for hire, um, which uh, we use to subsidize our summer series and our independent film screenings. So those clients could be all different, but sometimes they're real estate companies that want to put an event on their own roof. Sometimes they're corporate sponsors or broadcasters who want to do a special premiere. Um, all of those different revenue sources from, you know, corporations and sponsors go into the pool to help subsidize everything else that we're doing. Um, but our core target audience is 
the public at large. We always wanted to make events that were accessible um, to all different types of New Yorkers. So we do screenings in all different neighborhoods. We do screenings out in Coney Island. We'll do screenings out in Sunset Park. We try to, whenever possible, do screenings in less affluent areas, areas that might not have as many cultural events going on in their community as, they, as you know, some place like the East Village or Midtown Manhattan. Uh, so we try to bring films to all those different locations. And uh, some of the screenings are free, some of them are ticketed, um, but it's a really diverse income stream that we've uh, created, um, which combines with, like any other nonprofit, with grants and donations um, to keep us in business and keep doing events that we think are really special. What a stunning story of the evolution of a couple of guys who came out of college as young idealists, and they wanted to start a, quote, business and keep the commercial aspects out of it as much as possible. Now, 17 years later, Robert Redford is on the phone saying, hey, I want to be your business partner. <laughs> you couldn't have planned it. You couldn't have made this up. Yeah, well, we, we don't work directly with Robert Redford, but we do work with Sundance TV. We partner with Sundance Film Festival. We partner with a lot of different <laughs> cultural institutions all over the city, too. We've worked with MoMA, Film Society of Lincoln Center, BAM Cinema Tech, um, you know, pretty much any organization that you can dream up, um, we've worked with at some point along the line. But you could not have no. made this up. No, we absolutely, yeah, we didn't, you know, we didn't, there's not, uh, there wasn't really a model organization for us at the time. Um, I think there are a few other organizations around the country now where we feel a kinship with, where they, they followed us sort of a similar parallel um, narrative, and they've inspired decisions we've made, and we've inspired decisions they made. But at the time, you know, uh, you go back 22 years um, when we were uh, starting out, there weren't nearly as many film festivals in the country and, and in New York City. The ones that you had, you know, you have New York Film Festival um, and, and festivals like that, they're mostly connected to large cultural institutions. We're actually, we were, we were around a lot longer than Tribeca Film Festival. That's, you know, a for-profit endeavor and, you know, has big celebrities attached to it. They're very different organizations from us. So we really kind of had to make up the system as we went along, figure out ways to stay in business, but also stay true to our ideals. And there wasn't necessarily a model there for us. So, so how do you, Dan, wear two hats maybe multiple times a day? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you think with business instincts yet stay true to your founding roots as well. How, how does that work for you? How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do sometimes. And, and like any other business, there are times you have to make compromises. But, um, but luckily, you know, one of the things that's nice about us starting with uh, no profit motive at the beginning, and we weren't even thinking of ourselves as a business when we first started, is we had some time to establish our, our, our ideals and our goals without the pressure of investors or, you know, a big spotlight on us right at the beginning. Our first few years, we did one screening, then four screenings, then eight screenings, then 16. We were able to build organically, see what worked, um, but just as importantly, to establish an identity, um, both for ourselves, but also for the public at large, so that we knew what it was that we really wanted to achieve. And, you know, we could t try things out without you know, diving into something that we might not, we might regret committing to, um, you know, down the line. And so, you know, from my perspective, anything that we're doing that doesn't, you know, uh, that helps independent film and helps communities, um, brings people together via cultural events, um, and is, and, and none of, and there isn't anything getting in the way of that, um, then I, I feel like it's something that is, is on mission for us. And, our sponsors are great partners. Luckily, we've established an identity, so there's not that many sponsors who come to us and say, will you do this thing that compromises your ideals? Because if they're coming to us to work with us, they already believe in what we do. They want to reach our audience. If they were to do something that was really crass or commercial or, or you know, insulting to our audience, it's not going to be to their benefit anyway. So they listen to us when we talk to a sponsor and they want to put together an event. They know that when we have their, their needs in mind, but we also have our audience needs in mind. And if both of those are achieved in the same event, then everybody wins. They almost self-select you. To a degree, yeah. <clears throat> you know, we have a firmly established brand. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it took a long time to, to establish that. Right. But as a result, you know, we know what is not true to our ideals or what doesn't feel like a rooftop event, and we just don't do it. A couple of other operational questions, um, because it's so interesting, your story. On a night in July, how many units or events might you be running on a typical night? 
Yeah, so July is definitely the biggest, yeah. the, 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 the most busy time in the year. I'm, you know, we'll be doing sometimes three or four different outdoor screenings on the same evening, and some of them are, are massive. You know, we do, uh, in August, for instance, we'll do the Central Park Film Festival. That's a 7,000-person screening um, in Central Park. On How that many same people do you have? Okay, so you mm -hmm. have three or four events a night. Yep. How many crew members, employees do you have at each of those locations? Yeah, we could have anywhere between seven and 40 people at any given event. Employees. So yeah. And then what time would they have started arriving at that location? They'll usually, uh, we can set up pretty quickly. So they usually get there one or two in the afternoon, maybe noon if it's a really big setup. And we can get set up, um, build the entire setup with screen, projections, um, seating and everything. Uh, and, you know, maybe four or five hours and then we're ready to go. But then they must be calling somewhere saying, hey, we're the Central Park crew and we forgot duct tape. Yeah, well, we've got, um, we've got, a, we've got uh, you know, our, 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 our technical coordinators and managers, and they're usually sitting back there in the office ready to send stuff out. It happens all the time, and it's, they're there taking phone calls and emails and little uh, uh, updates on various apps to send that equipment out. Just, when this it's requires an incredible coordination. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you pull that off? Yeah, you know, luckily we've got some people who've been with us for several years, and, you know, you build a system. Um, there was a lot of experimentation early on, and early on we had no budget to work with whatsoever. You learn how to improvise, um, and it's all, you know, no matter what your setup it is, no matter how many events you're doing, if you're doing outdoor events, film or otherwise, you've got to be ready to improvise. The weather is a factor. <laughs> you know, things are going to happen. Um, so right from the beginning, you know, if you're going to ever do an event, you've got to be ready to change the plan when required. Um, so that's the sort of thing, you know, 15 years ago, uh, if a thunderstorm was coming through, I'd get pretty stressed out. Um, and, we, you know, we'd be checking our weather apps and worrying about those things. At this point, um, I see a thunderstorm coming through. We've got our procedures in place. We know what to do. And we can quickly cover up, make sure everything's safe and, and um, you know, prepare for whatever might be coming through and then maybe pull down the screen and then put it right back up once the thunderstorm's gone. Um, you know, that's true of weather, but it's true of any other contingency that you might have to deal with with all these events. You just get used to uh, staying in an improvisational mindset, mindset and you have three or four backup plans for any contingency and uh, one of them's going to work. We've actually never canceled a screening for technical difficulties, which is kind of incredible considering we do outdoor screenings. Um, and uh, I know a lot of film festivals that only do indoor film screenings, and they might cancel one or two a year. Um, and uh, we've, we have always managed to pull it off. The name, Rooftop Films, an ad agency, I don't know if they could have come up with that name for a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> right? Because it, it, it's a wonderful name. It's evocative. It's the image of summertime. Watching a film. Did you just stumble on stumble on that? Yeah, largely. I mean, you know, I mean, it's descriptive. Yeah. Um, and but you know, one of the things when we started out, um, as I mentioned, the showing it on a rooftop was somewhat out of necessity. But right. once we started doing uh, screenings on rooftops, we also started to realize that the Showing movies on a roof in New York City is completely different from showing it anywhere else. Uh, the great thing about being on a roof in New York in particular, and rooftop, you know, New York has a very big rooftop culture compared to a lot of other cities. But the thing that's great about it is it has a sense of being somewhat private. You're a little bit removed. You have a little bit of space from, like, the rush and... Um, of the city and the crowds, but at the same time, you're not really removed from the city. You're still very much a part of it. And um, as we moved along and we sort of developed what we were trying to achieve, we realized just how special that was for a film screening. You know, when we're showing a movie, like every year we have a program of short films called uh, New York Nonfiction, where it's all new short films about everyday New Yorkers and the amazing lives that they live. Um, you could show that movie in a movie theater and it would be great. Like, those films would play great anywhere. But um, showing it on a rooftop, surrounded by the city, you know, hearing the ambulance going by, uh, you know, all those little things, hearing the L train, you know, one of the elevated trains going by in the background, like, those little things change the way, not just that you see those films, but when you come out of that screening, it changes the way that you think about your city um, and changes the way you think about the rooftop that you're in, the building that you're um, just uh, on top of. All of those things are transformed 
Um, and that's um, an enhanced event and an enhanced experience that I don't think you can really create in a movie theater. Um, and, uh, and we program with that in mind. Every time we pick a film, we, you know, we pick films that we think for various reasons are going to not only work outdoors, but work at particular outdoor locations that we're going to screen them in. So, like, we'll be doing some screenings in uh, Greenwood Cemetery this year. Not on a rooftop. There's no rooftops in Greenwood Cemetery. But we've got some screenings there, some movies that are set in, t- in the 19th century. Um, we'll be doing our New York nonfiction screening there. All of that is enhanced by the location. What a great story. And Dan Nuxall uh, proves to all of us, having met him now uh, and heard about his, hearing about his crews, that there are nice guys in show business. <laughs> we do what we can. Yeah. Congratulations on what you've done. Best of luck. Thanks so much.